Thinking Biblically About Autism on this edition of Truth and Love. I'm Dale Johnson, and you're listening to Truth and Love, a podcast of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, where we seek to provide biblical solutions to the problems that people face. This week on the podcast, I have with me Dr. Daniel Berger. He is the lead pastor at Faith Fellowship Church in Clarence, New York. He's the founder and director of Aletheia Ministries. He serves as a director of Faith Biblical Counseling Center. And when he's not with his family and church family, Daniel continues to write and speak around the world in churches, organizations, medical communities, and at various counseling and teachers conferences. He's also an experienced pastor, counselor, school administrator, and the author of 13 books, which focus on biblical counseling, biblical phenomenology, practical theology, education, parenting, and history and philosophy behind the current mental health construct. Daniel earned his BS in counseling, an MS in counseling psychology, an MA in pastoral studies, and a doctorate in pastoral theology. Uh, Daniel, when you and I get together, we have a really good time uh, conversing. We have a lot of uh, similar interest as far as research is concerned, and we enjoy reading some of the same books that may bore the rest of creation, but we enjoy that. It's good to have you on the podcast again and to talk about this issue of autism. Truly my pleasure, Dale. Thank you uh, for your friendship, but also for this opportunity. And listen, I'm excited about the work that you're doing that the Lord has called you to up in Clarence, New York, and the church there, Faith Fellowship. So grateful that you're leading there now and, and enjoying some faithful ministry. Yeah, we, uh, we've we been there just over a year and just seeing spiritual and physical growth and, and just really excited to see what God's doing in our congregation and our and our family. Amen. Well, listen, we're going to talk about autism today. And, and this is, we, we jump into this knowing this is not a not an easy subject. The, the subject of autism, even that language has been difficult for so many people, whether we think about a particular individual or a family and knowing how to navigate these things. Sometimes the church has not done well in uh, dealing with children who've experienced autism or families who, who have experienced these things. I want to let's start at a place where we can understand autism. So help us to understand what we're talking about when we talk about autism. The first thing I want to say is autism is a, you know, what what we're calling autism represents a real physical problem. Autism in itself is a construct. So the word autism is simply seeking to describe real physical maladies that impair social, you know, ways of, of communicating uh, within relationships. They impair motor skills, uh, repetitive behavior, uh, sensory processing, et cetera. So I, one of the things that I point out when I counsel families is that autism itself, like if you, if you try to find autism in nature, we're never going to find that. That's, that's not, but we treat it as such. And there is a difference. Um, unfortunately, autism is classified in the DSM-5 as is essentially a psychiatric disorder, but I distinguish between, you know, the, the qualifier of a construct is just as important as the symptoms, if you would. And by that, I mean, some people would even suggest that the Trinity is a construct, a theological construct. Uh, so if we differentiate between a phenomenological or a psychiatric construct like schizophrenia, bipolar, ADHD, versus a physical construct that's seeking to understand like fibromyalgia, or autism. In other words, we, we're identifying physical pain, we're identifying physical struggles or struggles caused by some physical malady. That would be a differential. So I would start by saying autism is a construct, but not saying that there's not a physical problem there. Right. And I think that's why some people feel disoriented, even in part because it appears as a diagnosis in the DSM as if it's not, there aren't physical elements to it. So I think that's an important distinction. One of the questions that I get asked, Daniel, as I go around talking about issues of mental health and uh, inevitably in a QA, and uh, a someone will ask about this particular diagnosis, uh, the issue of autism, and they want to know a couple of couple of things. And they want to know, does the Bible say anything about it? So I want to I want to pitch that to you. Does the Bible speak about this issue of autism? Yeah. And just to even kind of bridge into this answer, the word autism is actually, unfortunately, coined by a eugenic psychiatrist named Asperger, who now they've taken Asperger's syndrome or disorder out of the DSM-5 because they're wanting to disassociate from that. But then Eugen Bluler used that term as well, another eugenicist. 
So it, it has a very controversial name in itself. So the, the word itself is not, it actually means to be removed or to be distant from reality. And I don't think that's an accurate assessment either. In other words, it doesn't even describe the struggle of a child. Uh, most autistic children, whether it's clear or not, they're there. Their soul is there. And I would argue that all of them are there. Their body is, is actually limiting our access to understanding their soul. So especially when there's nonverbal, you know, symptoms there. So when we approach the Bible, we have to immediately get this idea of looking for the word autism in Scripture. And that's true with a lot of man-made constructs. We have to be very, we, we won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but clearly God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are realities. They're, they're true. So you look at passages like 1 Samuel 21, uh, when David pretended to be, and most translations translate that word mad. Unfortunately, in Psalm 34, it's also uh, translated as mad there. Those are the only two cases, and they're both referencing this situation with King Achish, where David pretended to be, and the word that's, that's actually used is better translated, and in fact, it's always translated as discernment or taste. In other words, he pretended to lack discernment, and the result was very interesting. He did two things. He, he had repetitive scratchings on the post. Re- repetition is one of the habitual repetition is one of the symptoms of autism. And second of all, his spittle was running down his beard. So there was lack of, of motor control by how he framed his behavior. That word is also used in other passages like in Job that God removes the discernment of the elderly. And it has aided what we would call dementia. In other words, there's there's a place that when the brain has a struggle or is deteriorating, dementia is called a neurodegenerative disease, even though I think dementia is actually the natural process of the brain deteriorating. Uh, those, those are examples of valid physical problems. What causes those problems are, varies, but essentially scripture teaches on, you know, that these are, again, as we should expect, the, the sufficiency of Christ covers every possible scenario of human nature. Uh, that word is also used for tasting. Uh, that's the other usage where you taste. And of course, in biblical times, they didn't have the convenience that we did. If you ate spoiled meat, you would likely die. So they would taste, and just like we would taste the words of, of someone speaking, scripture actually uses it in that way as well. So when the Bible speaks on this, it's specifically speaking of, you know, this This is a child that clearly has what we would say the inability to express their, their moral nature, but it's not that their moral nature isn't there. And I, I think 1 Samuel 21 is is the best understanding of that. Well, I appreciate the way that you're you're helping us understand the dynamic in which the Bible speaks about our human experience and, and even acknowledges the lack of function in some ways as we see biological degeneration and the Bible's not unaware of that. Like God's not unaware of that in terms of our human condition. I mean, that is a byproduct of the fall of man, the sin of man. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 talks about the body decaying in uh, different aspects. And certainly if we're a holistic being, as the body decays, there will be lack of functioning on some level. But in the end, what we have to realize is that's where eschatological hope points us in the scripture, in the New Testament, that we long for a day when we're, we're not looking for something else to redeem us body and soul. We're looking to Christ to accomplish that. And that's the hope that we have even here. So let's get, uh, let's get practical. We've talked about this issue of autism, trying to understand it a little bit better, even some of the, the ways in which in wisdom God speaks about these types of symptoms, if you will. Let's talk practically about the church and how can the church help families who have an autistic child or have an, an adult child who's autistic, what are some of the things that the church can do to really help families who are, who are wrestling with this? That is uh, a loaded question that uh, we certainly won't have time to cover. But I, I think, first of all, would be, you know, even understanding the symptoms that, that we discussed, even with David, uh, none of those are moral issues. So we're not, we're not talking about like in, in another construct like ADHD, where there's actual a child is told to remain seated and they're getting up and running around. You know, there, there's not a, a moral diagnostic tool, if you would. These are all all moral issues. So I want to start there. And really, with that in mind, I would start with number one, teaching parents and then church members that there is a spiritual need as well as a physical need here. And it takes discernment on our part to recognize, does, does the child need to be spiritually 
taught and discipled, or is this something that an occupational therapist, a physician needs to address? And encouraging them to utilize occupational therapy, the repetition or what we would call neuroplasticity, that even in secular theory right now, neuroplasticity is part of, of what they're calling autism. There seems to be in what they would say normal children or normal childlike development, neuroplasticity is there. And the theory is that, that it's hindered in what we're calling autism through various things. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, as an example, autism is one of the symptoms. That's another thing I would say is just teaching parents to understand that physical things produce what we're calling autism. Usually autism is a symptom, not something in itself. But even as I've mentioned, encouraging them to go to occupational therapy. One of the things our, our church uh, does, we have a Sunday school class uh, that we teach special needs or disabilities, and we go through answers in Genesis. There's many other means and, and methods of, of teaching, but we want to make sure that they get the gospel. We don't know what God is doing in their heart, and so we are very cognizant. We're very purposefully giving them the gospel each week and allowing God to do His work. Uh, we also provide respite program. In fact, we're really excited about I've been at our church about a year, and we're launching that in November. We've been planning it from day one, and uh, already parents are just so excited. You know, so many families just get left by the wayside. Number one thing I hear from families with an autistic child is, like, we feel isolated. We feel left out. We just feel neglected. And so as church, just, you know, three simple things we can do is teach a uh, what I call a dualistic neurodiversity point of view that really highlights God's sovereignty. Psalm 139, the, this, this child and every child is fearfully and wonderfully made. This isn't a disorder that God somehow out of his order has made an accident or made a mistake. That is so important. So uh, I, I can't emphasize enough. I wish I had more time to express that, but we, we really just need to come alongside. If we, if we don't know what else to do, just come alongside and learn uh, help out, give some respite to these families, and minister grace to them. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah, those are some great ways I think the church can can really step in and help and really be hospitable and demonstrate uh, care, love, and concern and move toward the family as opposed to remaining distant out of ignorance of things that we don't know or we're afraid of. So I think that's really important. Now, as in many topics that we might discuss, autism is uh, is not without controversy. A lot of different controversies surrounding its construct. So, Daniel, I want you to talk about some of those controversies and how to think about those. Yeah, I, I think the historic nature of it in itself is controversial, but an article just came out in July that one in 30 children now, uh, some estimate, have autism. It's a 50% increase from 2017. So, either we're doing something or consuming something that is causing autism or where it's become so loose of a diagnosis that, you know, really it, it causes those who, who generally fall on the autism spectrum to be minimized. So why it's controversial is we're, we are talking about a spectrum. We're talking about uh, many people's view, a, a fluid concept that has no beginning and no end. And so if a child has behavioral issues, they can be diagnosed as autistic. And again, I want to be very careful and, and emphasize this actually hurts children that are truly autistic. It's, it's not helpful. There are a lot of benefits uh, for a child to be labeled as autistic, especially when they're having behavioral issues. So it's controversial because so many people now are saying my child is autistic and finding a doctor that would agree with that. If sensory processing is one of the symptoms, which it is, then if a child you know, has, has trouble seeing or has trouble hearing, does that qualify? If they're having social impairment, in other words, they don't have friends, does that qualify? So we have a very fluid construct, a very fluid uh, spectrum, if you would. And that's one of the things that, that really needs to be narrowed down. I like to say when you see autism, I mean, when you, when you see it, you know. And we have to be very, very careful and discerning and just lumping all behavioral issues into that. I did mention just briefly the history. Asperger coined the term autism, and then Bluler made it really popularized, uh, Eugen Bluler. And so that it is controversial in itself. So those are many ways that it's it's controversial. So hopefully that helps a little. Yeah, I think I think in giving us some of the constructs, understanding a little bit about autism, and then even some practical helps in the ways the church can engage 
and make this less scary to, to so many families and, and to be able to minister to families who have an autistic child. I think this is uh, very, very helpful. And I think it's helpful that we start talking about it because as we remain in ignorance, fear grows. And so we need to squelch that, engage in ministry in the church. So thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. You're listening to Truth and Love, a podcast of ACBC. You know, I thought this month, April, is Autism Awareness Month. I thought it would be a good idea for us to at least have a conversation like we've just had with Daniel on this subject of autism. It's a very confusing at times subject, uh, but we want to make sure that we're dealing with these types of issues from a biblical perspective. Uh, I want to alert all of our members to a specific resource, Dan and Pam Gannon, who we love, a physician and his wife, who is a nurse as well, did a webinar for us on this topic. If you want more resources for those who are members, that webinar is available on your member portal And so I want to encourage you, you can get CEUs by listening and paying attention to this particular webinar. So maybe your interest was piqued today, and I want to encourage you as members to go there. Avail yourself to the free resources that we have on your member portal. And for all of the rest of you, you can find out our other resources at biblicalcounseling.com.